This is part six of our bonus episodes covering your answer to my question of what is your number one biggest songwriting struggle? Let's get into it. Hello, friend. Welcome to another episode of the Songwriter Theory Podcast. Another bonus episode here covering your answer to the question, what is your biggest songwriting struggle? So we're going to get into more of your responses today. Again, if you haven't already, be sure to grab my free guide, 20 different ways to start writing a song. A big struggle that people often have is creative block, and a great way to get past that is to have 20 different ways to start writing songs because a lot of times our creative block is because we start our songs the same way. So we sort of end up going down the same path. It's like if you always go to the same beach, you're probably going to keep doing the same things. You'll hit the same arcades. You'll go visit the same places. But if you go to a different beach, all of a sudden now there's all these new options. You don't just fall into the same old habits because you can't. It doesn't have the same arcade there. It doesn't have the same boardwalk there. Not exactly the same thing, but it is a very similar concept. You'd be surprised how different your song can turn out and how much more creative you feel just by starting your song in a different way than you normally do. So if you want 20 different ways to start writing a song, be sure to check out the free guide, songwritertheory.com slash free guide. First response today is, well, I have this problem. I can't flow on a beat or sing on an instrument Thoughts cloud my mind, and that makes me not to concentrate, uh, makes me want not to concentrate. I'm not quite sure. Uh, basically makes it hard to concentrate, I think. I give up at the slightest moment. I am afraid to write lyrics. So there are a lot of struggles in there, um, but but all very, very understandable. So let's start with the first one. We'll just go in order for this one. I can't flow on a beat or sing on an instrument. So I'd be curious to know what you mean by that, because my guess is that in your opinion, you don't flow on a beat or sing on an instrument particularly well, which is different than I can't flow on a beat or sing on an instrument. It's sort of the difference between, you know, I can't play an instrument very well and I can't play an instrument. Or like, I can't sing very well and I can't sing. Almost always the can't is is, is maybe uh, being really harsh on yourself and not, not exactly true. So I'm going to assume that what you mean by this is that right now you you just you just haven't probably practiced enough and you haven't gotten in the habit of doing it enough to get better and better at quote, flowing on a beat or singing on an instrument. Like everything else, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. I highly doubt that you can't do this unless may maybe it's possible that you can't, we'll pick on the second part, sing on an instrument if you are completely pitch deaf, but almost nobody is. So it's probably not that. You're probably just being harsh on yourself, in which case this is an instance of just practice doing it more and more, and that's going to help you. Do something like record yourself playing a chord progression on loop for three minutes or um, you know, go find some – there are lots of YouTube videos. In fact, even I, I have a YouTube short that will automatically repeat. That's just one chord progression over and over again that you can just – let it play, and you can just practice improvising over it, which is a good habit, I think, to get into. In fact, I really want to build out a whole uh, a bunch of YouTube videos that are really just built for, hey, you want help with writing melodies? I will just give you these chord progressions on repeat, and you don't have to worry about the chord progression. You can just practice writing melodies because I think that's helpful for me. So I imagine it would be helpful for you all as well. But anyway, you can make your own, right? Very simply, just grab your guitar, do a random chord progression, play it on repeat for five minutes or something, or record it into your DAW if you have recording equipment, and then just literally put it on repeat, and then it can repeat indefinitely, and just practice doing it. You'll get better and better, especially if you record yourself practicing and you can listen back and then say, ooh, I see what I'm doing wrong there. You're, you're going to get better at it. Uh, it it. it almost certainly is not the case that you can't flow on a beat or sing on an instrument. Uh, also, I believe that that's the case because some of your follow-ups to this tell me that uh, 
the afraid part that you mentioned for lyrics is deeply ingrained in this entire comment. So thoughts cloud my mind, and that makes me not to concentrate. So I, I'm going to assume that you mean not able to concentrate. Thought, so thoughts cloud my mind, and that makes me not able to concentrate. That, again, is something where I, that could be anything from from uh, ADHD to, you know, you're just overthinking. I, you know, I, I don't know who you are, so I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know exactly where that's coming from. But I would say... Something that helps in today's day and age, I think, is take distractions away. Reduce the friction to become creative because a lot of us are trained into just consumption all the time and, 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 and just constantly feeling the need to fill our brains with stuff. Instead of taking from our brain and, and you know, creating something, we're so used to consuming things. We're, we just watch TV constantly or YouTube videos or listen to podcasts. We're just constantly consuming. And you need quiet. You need to turn all of that off to concentrate and to be creative. So make sure you're setting yourself up for success. Put your phone away. Something I'll often do is I will, when I come, this is in the basement, this is where I record this, and this is also where I record my music and very often write my music. Often, and I do it at night, often I will literally leave my phone, if not on the total opposite side of the basement. Sometimes I will literally leave it on my charger upstairs on my, my second floor, so two floors above me. So I don't even have my phone. So nobody can distract me with texts. I can't be interrupted. I just get to concentrate. Other things you can do, you know, if, if you find yourself on your computer and then you get, get on Amazon or you get on Facebook or you get on some news site or something, take, take the problem away, right? Don't be on your computer. The easiest way to concentrate is to take away all the things that are grabbing your attention. That's the easiest way. And it takes practice too, right? Constant, we in our day and age are so bad at concentrating on average I mean, there's many, uh, I won't go too deep into this because this is related, but not, ex you know, not exactly what we're talking about necessarily. But I'll never forget, uh, you know, s some kids who are like 12, where if you take their phone away, they almost have a meltdown. They are so used to just constant screen and knowing what's going on and being able to respond immediately if their friend texts them. Uh, partially because they're given cell phones way too young, obviously, but we, we won't go there because that's not what this podcast is about. But also, like, I don't know, if you give your eight-year-old a smartphone, what did you think was going to happen? Uh, anyway, uh, to each their own, but I don't understand how anybody thought that would end well. So so anyway, so a lot of times these kids are, like, helplessly addicted. They, they just can't not be consuming constantly. I got to know what's going on on Twitter or what whatever – 12, 13 year olds are on. Hopefully none, because it's terrible for them. Uh, but but you know, if they're on, God forbid, something like TikTok all the time, and their brain is just like consume more, swipe, 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 and hours can go by every single day. And you know, a lot of us were older when this stuff came out, so we're maybe not as addicted and helplessly addicted as a lot of very young people are, unfortunately. A lot of people are really addicted, right? I mean, people in their 60s, 70s now default to kind of scrolling on their phone. And 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 you may say, Joseph, that's unrelated. No, it's not unrelated because it all is connected to people are uncomfortable being bored or being alone with their thoughts. And that leads to not being able to concentrate and things clouding our minds constantly because we're so used to and almost need the constant consumption where to just even talk to somebody without also scrolling on our phone or to have dinner without having the TV on is unimaginable to a lot of people. And that is going to lead to it just being harder to be creative. It's just going to be harder. So, so for not concentrating and thoughts clouding your mind, again, I don't know your specific circumstances, but my advice would be whatever is distracting you, try to remove it as much as possible. Put your phone away. You know, don't, don't write music on your computer if you get distracted with the computer. I've found recently that I actually really like writing lyrics on paper again. 
just because less distractions. The only thing to do is to write because it's pen and paper. What else am I going to do? Am I going to go on Amazon on my notepad? No, this is not possible. So uh, I find that can be really helpful for concentrating. I give up at the slightest moment and I am afraid to write lyrics. I give up at the slightest moment. That's another, you just, you have to practice that out of yourself, right? It's, it's like sports teams that are so used to losing. They say things like this team needs to learn how to win. And that's a bit of a sports cliche, but there's a lot of truth to that. Cause sometimes you just winning is, is an art, you know, be success begets more success. The more success you have, you get more confident and the more confident you are, the more likely you are to have more success. Defining success as anything, right? I'm not talking about like, oh, you'll get a million. We don't talk about that here. We don't get into, because I'm a firm believer in the idea that popularity and how good something is artistically has very little to do with, with each other, unfortunately. Um, but when it comes to giving up, the answer is get in the habit of not giving up. Do something like set a timer and your rule is you cannot get up from that table until that timer is up. So you're not allowed to give up after 10 minutes of a struggle because you have to sit there for 30 minutes or 60 minutes. Anything that just makes it easier to not give up. I said that right, right? Yes. <laughs> and make it makes it harder to get up. You can also do things like have somebody who's going to hold you accountable, right? If if you have a spouse or something who you can say, hey, I want you to, to ask me to show you what I've written the last week, every week. And for you to be like, what, what is this? You didn't write anything this week. Whatever it takes to get you to not give up. But really, again, the answer that I'm sure you don't want to hear, but is true, is you have to just not give up at the slightest moment. You have to not. When you want to give up, don't. Right? We, any of us who are slaves to our emotions are screwed anyway. Right? It, just, just in general, you're never going to get, none of us are going to get anything done if we only do things when we feel like it and when it makes us happy. If I only made content you know, recorded a podcast, recorded a video, worked on a song, uh, heck, did code for my for my day job, a uh, bunch of other things I do that I won't get into. But like, if I only did those things when I felt like it, I just would, I would do way worse and, and would do way less, which also would make me way worse, right? Because the less you do of something, the less you're going to grow because you haven't done it as much. So, uh, Discipline is necessary and motivation is overrated because you should do some discipline is doing something, whether you're motivated or not. And discipline is how you get better at things and how you accomplish things. So the key here is discipline. If you're not motivated or you lose motivation because you give up at the slightest moment indicates a loss of motivation or something like that. The key is to be disciplined in that moment just because you want to give up. Doesn't mean you have to give up, just choose not to. And I know that, you know, it's easier said than done, but like that, that is the reality. Just for, force yourself to do it. You're going to fail sometimes. You might even fail at what I just said to try to do 90% of the time at first. But if 10% of the time you keep going and it actually works out, eventually it'll be 20% of the time you keep going and it works out. And then eventually you might find yourself that like, hey, I don't really have that problem of giving up at the slightest moment anymore because I've practiced discipline. And discipline gets easier when you practice it like anything else. And I am afraid to write lyrics. You're going to be less afraid the more you do it because you realize it's not scary. You know, no, nobody has to see your first draft. Nobody has to see your first 30 drafts. Nobody has to see all the lyrics that will never make the cut and won't be a part of any of your drafts. Nobody sees that. People only see the final product. So it only matters what your final lyric looks like. And your final lyric and your first lyric are probably going to be wildly different, especially if you follow my six-step lyric writing checklist, songwritertheory.com slash lyric checklist, where it breaks it up into baby steps, where each one of those steps is, eventually it gets you to that final product, right? But it takes six steps to get there. So when you're sitting to write lyrics, there is no pressure of this is going to be the final lyric 
I better say something profound in the moment and write something profound and amazing and poetic in the moment. No, everybody's going to crumble under that pressure. There's no need to put ourselves under that pressure. No type of writer puts themselves under that pressure. Like no writer does that. Movie scripts are edited. Books are edited. A uh, very common phrase is writing is editing. Or I don't know if it's a common phrase, but certainly one that a, 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 a marvelous composition professor I had in college said a lot that just has stuck with me because it's so true. The vast majority of the quality of your writing is absolutely in the editing process, not in the writing process. The writing process where you just sort of are on a discovery process, you're trying different things, uh, you're getting out some of the bad stuff that's like, uh, I don't want to ever use that. Uh, and then you just get nuggets of gold that then you refine in the editing process. So, so afraid to write lyrics is the more you do it, you're going to be less afraid of it. The more you do it well and you get better and better at it, the less afraid of it you're going to be. And again, when you're writing lyrics, like nobody's looking over your shoulder watching, right? So just remind yourself, nobody's ever going to see this, right? No, nobody has ever outside of the editor, right? Like no, nobody has ever seen the first draft of Star Wars, and then it was a massive hit. Who cares? I mean, actually, that's not totally true because there's so many books on it. George Lucas has talked a lot about what his original idea is. So I guess that one, we have a little bit more of an idea. And even still, nobody cares, right? If I remember correctly, there are some elements of the first draft where I'm like, well, that's terrible. Thank God we got what we got. Who cares, though? We got that Star Wars, and it gave us 30 great years before Disney ruined it. Like, it ruins literally everything, seemingly. So... Um, so, so your draft, the, the drafts don't matter. Nobody's looking over your shoulder. Write lyrics. Just just write them. And the more you write them, the better you'll get, the less afraid you'll be. Uh, and the more you'll get slowly prouder and prouder of your lyrics until you're to, to the point where, you know, you can feel like, you know what? I don't care if somebody doesn't like my lyrics. I'm confident in them. Getting into a creative flow. I'm sick and tired of sitting around, not writing anything, finally coming up with a verse or two and then not being able to expand on that from there. So cre creative flow. Two things on this. One is getting into a creative flow takes discipline on the at the beginning and then usually you find creative flow is usually earned, not given. So getting into a creative flow often looks like something Something like you sit down to start writing a song or to continue working on your song and the first 15 minutes are frustrating and you feel like you have writer's block and you're not coming up with anything good and it's a little frustrating, but you stay disciplined and then you keep writing. You say, I'm going to write for at least an hour. And then in the second 15 minutes, you're like starting to feel it a little bit more. You're getting a little less distracted than you were before. And then maybe 30 minutes in, 45 minutes in, then all of a sudden, after you didn't even feel like writing that day, after things weren't going well for the first half hour, maybe 45 minutes, then you hit creative flow. Creative flow often is earned, not something where you, a lot of times people just want to bypass the warm up stage of creativity. Very often, we just aren't ready to sit down and immediately be brilliant. Sometimes, sometimes it takes half an hour or 15 minutes of kind of getting into the flow before we really come up with something that's like, oh, okay, now I'm in the zone. And then some days it's just not going to happen at all. So creative flow can't be forced. It can be helped, right? I mean, even minor things like making sure you're distraction-free, which I just talked about, that should be an obvious one, right? Like if you are, you know, you have five kids and you're trying to write at the at the dinner table when they're all running around and and your 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 wife is asking you to, you know, wash the dishes and something. Like that that's not the time where you're going to be able to hit creative flow. You're going to get be interrupted. There's people around you, there's a lot of noise. So, you know, find the right time of day. For me, I write songs when my wife and my daughter are asleep. So there's no distractions, right? And I'm not sacrificing my time with my wife or daughter. Win-win. Um, so consider 
putting yourself in a position where you're more likely to get creative flow, which is get rid of distractions right at the right time. Also go with your biological clock. If I did all my songwriting early in the morning, probably wouldn't go super well. Uh, I'm more of a night person by nature. My ideal sleep schedule is probably something where like I go to bed at two o'clock in the morning. In fact, most of my adult life, I've gone to bed around two o'clock in the morning. And almost never have I gone to bed before midnight. I think I had a streak of 10 years where I never once went to bed before midnight. And on average, it was like one o'clock in the morning. Also, with my former band, that was a joke because we started to notice that all my, the best stuff that I was writing back in college always was post midnight. It was always like midnight to one. So lean into when for you is a natural creative time. You probably have certain times a day, maybe even certain days a week where you're going to be more creative. Maybe you're more creative after a long day of work, you know, directly after. I doubt it, but maybe you are, right? Right, right at four or five when you're done with work. Maybe you're most creative when you have had a break from work just of a few hours, so eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Maybe you're a morning person. Maybe it's best for you to wake up at six o'clock in the morning an hour earlier than you normally would for work, and that's a great time to be creative. Maybe for you, you need like a Saturday afternoon all by yourself, and because you haven't had to think about work that day, you're going to be more creative. Put yourself in a position to succeed. Um, and then... For I'm sick and tired of sitting around, not writing anything, finally coming up with a verse or two, and then not being able to expand on that from there. That, uh, I think, is the same problem that we've talked about a lot in, in this these response bonus podcasts, which is outline first. Then you have an outline of what exactly each song section is supposed to say, and then you don't have the problem of not knowing where to go next. Because you know where to go next. You just have to figure out how to expand on it. You know what your second verse is about, but you don't know exactly how you're going to communicate it. But at least you know what it needs to say. Because it is kind of the worst when you write, you know, maybe two verses and now you're like, now what? I feel like I have nothing else to say. But that's a problem that can be completely eliminated by outlining before you write. So that's probably the, the best solution for that. I know we've talked about that a lot recently, so I won't go any deeper into that one. Joseph, I do not struggle writing songs. Great. <laughs> if I do not have the inspiration, I do not write a song. I will be clearer. I am not the kind of songwriter who says, today I will write a song about this or that. I cannot do that. Your advice has been so good, and I appreciate your guide. Thank you. Take care. Well, thank you, good sir. Or ma'am, but statistically, sir, because I think 90% of the YouTube audience at least is male. It's something really high, 95%. So I do not – so so I know that you said I do not struggle with writing songs, so arguably there's nothing necessarily to respond to. But I will say if I do not have the inspiration, I do not write a song – I think that's fine if songwriting for you is firmly in the hobby area, right? You you really don't. It, it's just something that is kind of fun, but it's not like a craft that you really care about. It's just fun for you. Then I think that's fine. But if you're somebody who's like, I really care about the craft of songwriting. I want to get better at songwriting. I want to look back in 10 years and be like, I'm a better songwriter today than I was 10 years ago. What I call a endeavor. I make the distinction between a hobby and an endeavor. A hobby for me is something like playing board games. I like uh, what used to be called Euro games. Some people call them strategy games, not crap like Mon Monopoly and Stratego. And Stra Stratego is actually kind of okay. Um, and and like Sorry and all that is terrible garbage. But like real board games, the stuff that came from Settlers of Catan, although Settlers of Catan itself is also kind of garbage. But all the games that came from it and were inspired by it, not all of them, but a lot of them are great. Anyway, that's a hobby for me, but it's, it's not an endeavor. I don't like care deeply about the art of board games. I'm not making my own board games. It's just a fun hobby. It's genuinely for fun. Songwriting, though, I fancy as an endeavor. It's something I deeply care about. I don't think to myself, oh, I haven't played board games in a week. That's a problem. No, who cares? It's just a fun hobby. But if I don't songwrite in a week, to me, the main distinction between endeavor and hobby 
is an endeavor is something that you would do even if you don't feel like it because you care about it such that you don't just go by your whims. And then a hobby is something where like, no, you, you just do it when it's fun, right? You're not trying to do anything with skiing. So you just ski when you think, oh, I want to ski. But songwriting, if you care about it as an endeavor, you should not just write when you're not inspired because a lot of times the inspiration comes from perspiration, right? If you work, then eventually you get inspired. You spend 30 minutes not being inspired and then inspiration hits. So to, to only write when you're already inspired, you're pre-inspired, you just got inspired with without working for it. If it's a hobby for you, totally fine. If it's more of an endeavor for you, you really care about the craft of songwriting, the art of songwriting, I would I would advise uh, to break out of that a little bit and and try to get in the habit of writing whether you're inspired or not. Um, and then I'm not the kind of songwriter who says, today I will write a song about this or that. I cannot do that. I think... I think very often most most songwriters don't necessarily do that. At, at least the vast majority of songwriters seem to do music first. Myself included, as somebody who cares deeply about lyrics and who used to be a poet-style songwriter, as I call it, which is basically you write your lyrics first, the whole poem first, and then you write the music. Uh, I've totally flip-flopped on that. Now I write the music first because I find it's just an, an easier way to get the things I care about all right and as I want them. So even as that sort of person, I, I, I guess just, I'm not sure that for most songs I say that either. It's more that I go to the keyboard or I go to you know a bass or I just improvise a bass line or I start with a song title. It's, it's more of an organic process than me sitting down and being like, I'm going to write a song about X today. Very rarely do I do that, partially because I think, I think there's almost a danger in that. Not always, but I think a danger in that is that's when we can move from art to propaganda. Because a lot of times if we're saying, I'm going to write a song about X today, that might be where we're getting into, I'm going to write a song to convince people of this, or I'm going to write a song to communicate this message. And the second we get into that, we're getting into propaganda and away from art. Because art should be more about discovery. It shouldn't be about preaching any sort of message. It should be about uh, telling the truth of the world. And it, 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 it shouldn't, of course, it's going to be formed by your worldview, but it shouldn't be you imposing your worldview. There's a difference, right? Of course, in things I write to a degree and things you write, your worldview is going to influence that. That's totally fine and good even. But if you are imposing your worldview and you're just thinking about how do I hit somebody over the head with my worldview, what I think is right, that's just preaching. That's just propaganda, right? There's no discernible difference between that and, you know, the old communist USSR Russia or old Nazi Germany or something just making stuff, right? Pictures, paintings, you know, commissioning paintings. They did that a lot. Commissioning songs to be written. I'm not sure if that part is real, but I know the other two are real things they did. Uh, actually, one of them even commissioned a movie to be made specifically to manipulate people into believing certain things. That's like, what's the, if you sit and say, I'm going to write a, a song about this message, how is that any different? The only difference is presumably those, you know, <laughs> those two are evil things uh, and you presumably aren't. But like the fundamental, you know, they didn't think they were evil either. So like the fundamental idea of like, that's what propaganda is though. Propaganda isn't just stuff you disagree with. Propaganda is propaganda, whether you agree with it or not. And propaganda is, is never art. It's not art, um, which is a huge problem in almost every art form today, unfortunately. But all of that long, long thing to say, uh, I think it's uh, maybe a good thing that you don't say to, that to, that you, ne you never say, today I will write a song about this or that, because I think there's maybe a danger in that. It's better to, be, to allow it to be organic, I think, because we're less susceptible to preaching or, um, yeah, 
propaganda in our songs and we're more likely to be truly artistic. I have listened and learned a lot about many points, but I still don't know whether I need to begin with a melody, harmony, in parentheses, chord sequence, song structure, or lyrics. So I end up trying bits of each and getting unfocused. My favorite way to go is to start with what I call a musical engine or song engine, which is really just to say it's it's usually harmony focused, but it's not a chord progression. What I mean by that, excuse me, is it's not a straightforward chord progression. Often when, when people think of starting with a chord progression, they think of something like, oh, I'll do like a one, five, six, four, and I'll do C major, G major. And I'll just like strum it on a guitar. That's usually, I think, what people think of, partially because most songwriters are guitars. But for me, I like to start with something that's more interesting than that, because very rarely is a strummed guitar chord progression going to be particularly interesting, especially if it's a stock chord progression. So instead, starting with just any musical part that resonates with you, maybe it's a piano riff, which is one of my favorite go-tos, or a bass line, or a guitar finger picking pattern, or if you do come up with an intro, the chord progression is probably what's almost never going to be the interesting part of your guitar part, but you come up with an interesting rhythm that makes the chord progression a little more interesting. Something like that is a great place to start and then write the melody on top of that and then develop the lyrics. There's a little more to it, right? But it's generally song engine, and then, if necessary, figure out the underlying chords that go with it, then melody or song engine, melody, and then figure out the underlying chords and then write the lyrics. I think that's the best overall way. If I had to pick one way, it's that. I think it's the best of all worlds because the easiest way to get a combination of a sweet, say, piano riff or guitar riff and also a great melody and also killer lyrics, I think, is that direction. If you write your lyrics first and then write your melody, which, by the way, if you write lyrics first, the natural next step usually is going to be melody because melody and lyrics are directly connected. You literally sing the melody while you're singing the lyrics. Right? It's the same thing. It's just one is the words and one is the pitches and the rhythm. Uh, but the chord progression is more disconnected, right? But a chord progression is very connected to the melody because you can't have any melody over any chord progression. Hence the songwriter bridge principle that I think I mentioned in one of these episodes uh, I won't talk about that at length. Again, it's mentioned in my course or taught at more length in my course. But for writing songs, if you start with your melody, you can then from there pretty easily either write the chord progression or the lyrics in any order. It doesn't matter. If you start with the, mel if it, the lyrics, probably write the melody next and then write the chords or you can start with the chords and or a musical engine. So something like a guitar riff, bass line, piano riff, et cetera. And then write the melody and then write the lyrics, which again is my favorite. There's a bunch of different ways to go, but uh, don't, don't over complicate it. Commit to one. Um, not, not for all your songs, right? But when you're writing a song, Especially at first, just, you know, pick one and go with that for the song. Eventually, mixing and matching is fine when you get more used to the flow of each of them. So sometimes I will mix and match, but I wouldn't recommend it early on. If you're already having struggles with, you know, not knowing where to start and you try bits of each and you get unfocused, as you say, that to me is a sign. Pick one for a song and commit to it for the whole song. And then for the next song, maybe consider a different methodology. But again, over simplistic view the three, just to make it really, really clear. Cause I feel like I said a lot of words and I want to make sure we end it in a clear way. Option one, chord progression and or song engine, then melody, then lyrics. I'm ignoring song structure. Cause that's sort of a totally separate thing. Um, so maybe we'll come back to that then. If you start with melody, then you can go in either direction. From melody, you can either do melody and then lyrics and then chord progression or melody, chord progression, and then lyrics. And then if you start with lyrics, the natural next thing is usually to write the melody that goes with the lyrics and then figure out the underlying chord progression for the melody. But if you're going to go in that direction, you need 
almost need music theory, as I've mentioned before, which shouldn't be a problem. Music theory is super helpful for songwriting, but some people really hate it and are stubborn about it. So I'll just give you that preface. If you're one of those people that's anti-music theory, don't go in that direction. Stick with the chord progression, melody, and lyrics, because that's the easiest way to write a song if you don't know any music theory by miles. Miles and miles. <laughs> uh, to the point that, like, it's, it's, it's going to be so frustrating to write a song in any other way if you don't know music theory other than that. So hopefully this was helpful to you. Thanks again for listening. Hopefully this was helpful to all of you and you guys are enjoying these bonus episodes where I'm getting into details on your specific struggles because it's taken a lot of time. So so, so hopefully it's, it's, it's helping you and I'm not just talking to no one and everybody's like, all right, I don't care. Uh, that would be discouraging, <laughs> but alas, we are probably getting close to the end of these episodes, but we shall see. We shall see. We're probably going to get to at least 10, if I were to guess. Thanks again for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to grab my free guide, songwritertheory.com slash free guide for 20 different ways to start writing a song, which is a great way to stay creatively fresh. It's a great way to mix up your songs so that they don't all sound the same. Just a great way. How you start is very, very important. Just ask anybody who has built anything ever. If you start with a bad foundation, you're kind of screwed. So mixing up how we start can be a great way to make sure that each of the houses we build or whatever analogy you want to pick for our songs turn out pretty different because we started differently. So it makes sense that they would end pretty differently. Thanks again for listening or listening and watching if you are watching on YouTube. And I will talk to you in the next one.